so we can call them into order now. Six o'clock. Okay. Great. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? I think we're supposed to uh, do chapter six on the essential school board book. Excellent. Put that in uh, 8.7 discussion items. Chapter six. Okay. Okay. All right. Is there any other adjustments? Okay, then we are looking for a motion to approve the minutes from Tuesday, May 7th, uh, our annual meeting, and also Monday, May 20th, which was our uh, regular board meeting that just got rescheduled. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. I'll move on to public comment. Uh, do we have any public comment? I see we have two phone numbers and uh, Kristen LaPel. Um, uh, does the phone number ending in one nine have a comment? I see they are unmuted. Okay. Does the phone call ending in three eight have a comment? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I missed. What am I commenting on? I must have missed part. No, of that. No, this, sure, no problem. This is just the beginning of our meeting, and there is two public comment sections, and this is just the first one. Uh, we just uh, approved the minutes, so um, it is an opportunity for comment. That doesn't mean you need to. I just want to make sure that um. Voices are heard that want to speak. And like I said, there is another one at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Great. Nancy, we are at public comment at the beginning of our meeting, if you have any comment. And there is also one at the end of our meeting. So um, seeing none, we'll move on to board comment. No? Okay. No board comment? Let's go to the reports to the board. Superintendent's report. Um, so the board has my report in hand. I would just add, I mentioned this during the uh, full board meeting, is that the yield bill um, that was approved by the Senate and House for some reason didn't move forward to the to the governor's office for signature yet. So the veto window days hadn't started the counting. Um, before it just becomes law, it's five business days, once presented to the governor and needs signature, um, or without his signature, it would become law if he didn't veto it. Um, and that update I received actually came through the VSBA. So I was, I, I'm not, I, that was late last week. So I don't know what's going on with that bill and why it wouldn't have just moved over once approved. So. Stay tuned on that. Uh, the good news is within that yield bill, the yield number is higher than what we had originally used in our annual meeting, which means it will have a positive result on the uh, estimated finalized homestead tax rate, um, which is good. And um, just another bill that would affect us. We don't, it's been a long time since we had a virtual only meeting, but as of July 1, that option would go away unless there was like a state of emergency. We're still allowed to utilize a virtually, virtual only mm -hmm. meeting. There was talks about uh, municipal boards needing to provide hybrid. Um, that part of the law did not move forward. So certainly hybrids encouraged. We try to provide hybrid as much as possible, um, right? Um, but certainly we need to have a physical location warned. Um, and in the event that it was a situation we needed a special meeting and we were concerned about being able to get a you know, meeting to happen at one of our buildings, a district board could always warn the central office location as well and we, the management could be there to greet the public mm -hmm. and we could still hold a hybrid meeting that way as well. Um, so there's 
there's you know ways to navigate that law, but I just wanted folks to know that virtual only option is gone. Um, is it of July one? As of effective July one. Okay. Yep. Um, so that's true for subcommittees as well. Correct. Okay, yeah. Good to know. Yep. The yes, it, it provided virtual only for a few specific type of subcommittees of the board, but it would it wouldn't be like um, when you guys were holding uh, the endowment committee. That would yeah, that would be a physical location. But again, it could be the SU office. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just wanted to let folks know that the. Oh, question. Yeah. yeah. By doing that, <clears throat> could the committee all show up virtually? Or just, yes. Okay. Yep. As long as, so within the open meeting laws, it's always read that it needs either a member of the board or a member of management to be able to greet the public, right? To provide access to a meeting okay. if, you're, if you're conducting it via hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Otherwise, you know, schools, you know, they kind of wind up, not down. Uh, a lot of good things happening um, in regards to planning for the summer. I just reviewed today with the central office admin team and ARSA is uh, one of all of our districts that are planning for summer work this summer with teams and teachers um, to do curricular development, but also in regards to just planning around um, literacy, math, and social emotional for the upcoming year. Um, and those those teams will be supported via our grant funding that we've received um, at the SU level, both title funds, but also on the received uh, about a hundred thousand dollar grant to support our work in literacy and math instruction. Um, and we are are just about finalized with the WRBSU communications plan. We will, we're emphasizing under goal four a, a little stronger feedback loop in regards to how we're progress monitoring feedback from our staff and teachers to make certain that that's captured in the plan explicitly, um, which was good feedback we got from the last full board meeting. And then finally, the board will talk about, I've, I've suggested this idea to try to get uh, more of the SU full board in person, the idea of holding an August retreat um that would allow for the full board to meet in the morning have lunch together um and then have break off sessions with district boards in the afternoon and possibly even come back and then share out the work of the different district boards because i think everyone's got a little bit something different they're focused on um, working on right now but i think they could we could learn from each other so that's something that i suggested and got pretty good feedback at the full board level we're going to be putting out this week um a survey to see what Saturday might be available in August for board members to come. So that's on your agenda to talk about later as well. But I wanted to mention it because it is the uh, Grable Hancock reorg meeting tonight. So I do have to kick them off tonight and at least get them through their okay. reorg at 630 and then I'll be back. Um, and I'll entertain any questions folks may have. Oh, before that, actually any questions on the report and I have an addendum to my report. You didn't mention that we're, the, the SU board is very close to finalizing a portrait of a learner, both the design and the attributes, the, the end products of what we hope we can achieve with every one of our students graduating from whether elementary, middle school, or high school. It's been a long time process, and it's very close to getting done and getting done well. So I just wanted to point that out, and thank you. that'll be another accomplishment. Um, uh, so we need the board approves it in June. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, so in regards to my addendum, um, if you remember the SU back in the spring, I'm chuckling because this has been a work in progress. Back in the spring of 2021, Tara? Yeah, 21, I think. Uh, received a EPA rebate grant to purchase three electric buses and provide infrastructure. So we've been working, we, we changed uh, transportation providers last year. So we wanted to make certain that we were able to get a pass through with STA that allowed them to junk three of their buses because that's part of the grant to then bring on three new electric buses. Um, we have received some quotes for infrastructure that seemed hot too high for us uh, our appetite earlier in the fall 
Um, and so STA has gone back out to bid for buses. The good news is the buses have come under our award amount. So the award will cover, fully cover three brand new electric buses, um, which is great news. And so we have been working to map out what routes made the most sense for charging to be able to serve our students via electric buses. And so the three routes that we had identified that would work were Stratford, Sharon, who were really the two towns that had pursued this grant with the SU to begin with as part of Two Rivers out of Quichi, um, and Stockbridge. So we were awarded $20,000 per charging infrastructure. Um, the bid at Stockbridge came in at 34939 so the difference is 14,939. Um, so that one quote, we, well, this is the second bid we received that have actually been on it. This is lower than our original bid. When we came to you in the fall, the three of them were higher than these three bids that we received. So the difference is the 14,939. The bus company has worked with this provider before. And this is like turnkey, right? This, this, is the level two charging station. It's all the hookup. It's working in conjunction with Green Mountain Power and it's doing all that permitting and things that we need. Um, so yours actually came in the lowest. And the other two are actually a little higher. So those boards will have to decide. So I'm just trying to get a sense from the board around whether that's something they want to continue to pursue or not. It's not, the grant's not written in a way that if we only did two electric buses that the other two couldn't move forward. It's written in a way that, you know, we they've set aside a certain amount up to three. We don't have to necessarily do all three. So Tara and I met with the EPA again this morning, and they're willing to give us another extension to July. Um, but soon, you know, they keep giving me extensions on this one, so it's soon they want me to so we no. no, I was just uh, Pat just thinks it's really <clears throat> disagreeing. I just want to. Yeah, I like the idea. Uh, does that mean if we turn it down, the whole everything? No. So if if we have any one of the three boards say, Jamie, it's too much, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't want to install the charging station. Mm -hmm. They would allow us still to do a request for two buses and, and two charging stations. So we lose a bus? We will lose the bus. Oh, the bus yeah. um, Only because we're so spread out as an SU, right? And most of our districts use one bus. Like, it doesn't make sense for us to say like, oh, we'll do a charging infrastructure at, I'm just gonna throw out there, Bethel, right? Mm -hmm. By the time you like charge your buses and then dispatch off, you lose so much power, especially in the winter months with the heaters, mm -hmm. we're worried about it not working. Mm -hmm. Hence why we want to put a charging infrastructure at each location. So I have noticed that there seems to be two different models that buses are either housed at a central location like in our parking lot or people, bus drivers actually bring them to their residence. So in this case, it would, them, it wouldn't, and those three schools, it will always live at the school. It would always have to live at the school. Yeah. Well, another way of looking at it is for $14,000, which is the extra amount, yeah, we get ourselves a EV school bus, safe, brand new, state of the art, and a charging station. And we've got a lot of miles between the two schools that so we want safe and secure. And we're setting the way positively about whether it's global warming or or energy saving, well, so I, I think that's tomorrow. not going to help a lot. Uh, no, I don't either. I just, and again, it's not something that I need board permission to do, right, at this type of money, but it's just one of these things I want, I wanted to discuss with the board and get a consensus from you guys, like, if you were supportive. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, from my discussion with Keith earlier, too, it sounded like it wouldn't, it would be for next. The infrastructure will go in sometime in the next four months. Okay. Um, and as soon as that infrastructure is in, you know, we're, we'll order the buses once I get the thumbs up from each one. Okay. Okay. So I, so I actually think, think we'll be running them next school year. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea. Um, I guess my only other question would be, okay, we have, 
we have the solar going in, do we maybe talk to them as well and see if they can give us a quote? We can see how they're already going to be there. And then um, one thing that, I mean, we can get into this a little later, but I wanted to piggyback on that was the, the idea of bringing, right now there's the solar array that is in the field and there's an extensive battery backup system that's built into it that was never hooked up to anything. <laughs> and so we are having issues right now, Stockbridge Community Meals to Go, where when there's power outage, they're losing power to the refrigerators and it's thawing out the food. And in some cases, it's, it's no good. So I've had to help out on a number of cases, bringing a generator down, whatever. So our thought is, is to bring power underground from the batteries on the other side of the field over to the uh, concession stand building so it has a battery backup system when the power is mm -hmm. out and possibly maybe be able to get some funding from that program as well to help. So I know it's something Deborah is concerned about. So I don't know if that's, you know, just that's something. Power's on the end too. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, I think it'd be great to do it all at the same time, take care of the solar, the, the charging station, and, and bringing that power over. So it's just my two cents. Sean, is that something you can? Um, yeah, we'll talk a little the, when the, we get into the contractor. The, and yeah, yeah, so when we get into that a little later here, that's just a, a small part of what I want to talk about. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Great. Okay. So if there's no other questions for the superintendent, we'll move did, on. Did you want a sense from Cynthia? Oh, sure. D Cynthia, do you have any comment on the electric bus? Uh, um proposed like, going forward with um i would we'd have to spend the money for the there's fourteen thousand dollars for the infrastructure for the charging station <laughs> okay Nancy, I'm yeah, Nancy, I'm muted. All right, well, uh, the, the quorum is <laughs> giving you a direction. I don't hear any. <laughs> yeah. From Cynthia. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to the business manager's report. Tara. Good evening, everyone. You have my report, which outlines what's happening here in the business office through the month of June. And then also um, on the discussion items, which I just wrapped up, our RFQ is the FY25 tax anticipation note. And Ray, I emailed that uh, to you just a little bit ago to put up on the screen as well. The biggest things that's happening, um, obviously getting the budget files to the state and then um, getting everything wrapped up for our fiscal year software rollovers, and then um, starting the grants and getting those submitted by the deadlines for fiscal year 25. But on our tax anticipation note, uh, there is a request for me to go back out to see what our options were out there. So I requested proposals from M&T Bank, Northfield Savings Bank, Community Bank, Community National Bank, and Mascoma Bank. Of those, uh, Northfield Savings Bank and Community Bank, or, or Community National Bank, sorry, who is our current lender, uh, both provided proposals. Uh, M&T Bank did not respond, and Community Bank and Mascoma Bank were not interested in providing proposals at this time, um, but asked if we were interested in the future to please feel free to reach out. So of the two responses that we got, uh, Community National Bank, again, that's our current letter, lender, the lending rate for the tax anticipation note would be 4.81%, an earning rate of 5.06%. Northfield Savings came in with a lending rate of 5.49 and an earning rate of 3.05. So obviously my recommendation is to stay with Community National Bank. And based on cash flow analysis, 
the FY25 tax anticipation note for Rochester Stockbridge would be $986,380. Great. I agree with, you, with your uh, recommendation. The, uh, the lending rate is um, nice and, the, the, and low, and the um, earning rate um, is higher, so that's great. So that's under 8.5 once we get there, but um, okay. just I'm glad Terry went over that in case for some reason we're both gone. Okay. <laughs> with Grand Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, I didn't want to leave that up to you, Jamie, to try to go through. <laughs> Great. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. So, any other questions for our business manager? Okay, well then, uh, principal's report. Yes, so starting with just the, not just that, but the principal's report itself, there's a couple of reports in there this month. Um, you're kind of in that time of year where who told me today a kiddo told me today that time is limited miss Stephanie. time is limited <laughs> uh, trying to negotiate something they didn't want to do um but we are in the final two weeks of school which is hard to believe with kiddos but we're also already starting to plan for next year as well as for some summer work um a couple of highlights uh and we'll talk about it a little bit in the celebration of learning is we had field day last week with both schools all together and that was very successful lots of fun especially if you enjoy being wet um do a little drip drip drench and then the other things that i'll add is um we have some end of the year celebrations so Next week on June 12th, Robert, uh, Rochester sixth grade graduates at 5.30 p.m. That's the 12th? That's the 12th, yep. Rochester, that we're ready. Uh, hopefully <laughs> out back, 5.30. <coughs> hopefully out back, but the rain location is the gym. And then uh, June 13th, Thursday at 5 p.m. Stockbridge sixth grade graduation. <coughs> and that's either out back or in the multi-purpose room. And then um, on the 13th, we'll also do some preschool and year celebration. Okay, yeah. They do those during the day with families. Um, and then the other thing I'll share is we've done two different sixth grade trips this year. Rochester sixth graders went to Boston for a very long day and loved it. Um, though I think their favorite part was not the Museum of Science or the aquarium, but the turkey hats they bought at Daniel Home. <laughs> Got a great picture. And then they chose to do a walk-in in their class. Like they were all about sleeping here in the book what they wanted to do they were okay. adamant about it um, so they did that uh friday night so they got back from boston had pizza and stayed here watched a movie played some games in the jet oh the long day yes wow yes uh, so who is doing 24 7 <laughs> so uh miss h our 456 literacy teacher who will be our student service provider did that but those kids and a lot of parents there are a lot of parents that took different shifts to do that. Um, and then Stockbridge sixth grade left this morning to test out Major's classroom, which is kind of similar to Key Laden. It's a, it can be anywhere from a three to five day trip. They're doing four days and three nights. Oh, wow. Um, and they went with our four, five, six teacher and Miss Braun. And the thought is, if this goes well, that next year that will be our combined sixth grade trip to kind of culminate all the outdoor ed learning that we've been doing. So um, the past couple of years since COVID, as sixth grade trips have come back, kind of let the kids choose what they would like to do, which is why each building has kind of done something different. Mm -hmm. um, but the we're headed back in the direction of doing something together. And as much as they love outdoor ed, it seems like this is a good so checking out the location and seeing how how that goes and I got out. That's nice. the principal's report, so to speak. 
you should mention that you're also holding a reading at Pittsfield Saturday. Oh, yeah. And then Saturday, um, June 8th at 10 a.m. is their story hour at the Pittsfield Library. And so we're working in combination with um, with them to hold different community connects. So they have like the craft and the storybook. Uh, and we're gonna provide snacks and they want that to be an ongoing partnership. So uh, like every other. So Pittsfield, what time? 10. Okay. Yeah. Oh, not the 10th. 10th. No, sorry, the 8th <laughs> at 10 a.m. Um, yeah, yes, and then we're still working on dates with the AMCAP letter because she just did all their summer stuff, which they can do well. Nice. So we'll do something similar. Those Both libraries seem to have a pre established story time set up. So we're trying to work in conjunction with that because that's when most of their small families, their younger families, seem to come. Yep, absolutely. Um, Right. Any questions on effort? That's a lot of information. No? Not for me. Anybody else have any questions for Well, I suggest this that we, our side staff takes this on the off and put as much as you can because you certainly deserve it. Yeah. Some of them will be very excited to hear that. <clears throat> and are probably counting down the days. If there's no questions on that, then we can move on to the academic benchmark report. Um, so before we go too far, just on page one, the important thing to notice at the very bottom in that italic is that last year we tested in April with track my progress, but the state switched their assessment calendar around. So we had to flip flop our assessment calendar around, meaning last year's state assessments were in May. This year they were in April, so we kind of did a flip flop. Okay. And what that does is it changes what window we're testing in on track my progress. Mm -hmm. So we went from the spring window last year to the summer window, uh, mm -hmm. like an early in the summer window, like the beginning, because the summer window doesn't end until August. Um, and so what that does do is it can change that expectation of proficiency by anywhere from two to 13 scale score points, depending on the grade level. Okay, well. I don't think it impacted us too much. Um, so it does kind of change some data points when you look at um, this year to last year. So like if you're trying to compare last spring to this spring, it's, it's not gonna, feel exactly the same, and that's, the benchmark's a little bit. So, just a little uh, disclaimer that's important, I just remind myself when I was looking at it. Yeah. Um, so if we start on kind of goal one uh, with our average, our English language arts average scale score to exceed proficient by 2025, our um, scores, or our average scale scores by grade level are in the purple. And then the, um, oh, I guess I didn't print, oh, it's at the top. And then the, um, what's considered proficient is that green triangle. Um, and the more, green numbers? And the green numbers, right? Okay. Purple, purple dot, purple numbers. Yep. Green triangle, green numbers. So what you'll see there when you look at that is that <clears throat> our primary grades, especially our K and one in ELA are, um, Um, are, proficient. are proficient or higher as an average. And what I'll say about that uh, ELA overall is from fall to summer, so from the beginning of the year when we first tested to now, um, all of our grades, grade levels except fifth grade, are making a year or more worth of progress. Oh, so we're cool. a year or more worth of progress. So we are definitely making, closing some gaps. It's starting to show that we're now about a year and a half into using consistent uh, literacy materials with fidelity, right, with our direct instruction. <clears throat> so we're starting to see those things be, for our younger kids who have had it since the mm -hmm. get-go, we're seeing that kind of pay, pay off. Um, you can tell 
in our upper elementary that they've gotten a lot of different approaches mm -hmm. until the past year and a half. Uh, what we're also seeing in addition to that I'll share is we're in the process of doing our end of year direct instruction placement testing and um, we are seeing kids jump whole proof levels in oh, their wow. placement testing. So like uh, a couple of examples is we have some kiddos who have been in what's called Reading Mastery 1 all year and they just finished, which was exciting because then you get a different book. They love that, which is very cool. And they tested into Reading Mastery 3 for the fall. Oh. And similar situation we had in both buildings. So we've seen that happen with some of our younger kids. So we are seeing a majority of our students, it's truly just the once you learn how to decode, it really takes off for you and you can comprehend what you're That's reading. Great. Yeah, it is great. Areas that we're still kind of trying to work on uh, in English language arts is um, really the biggest focal point, I would say, is close reading. That's not necessarily a skill, but it's the idea that you could read a paragraph and the question can be, pick a sentence that summarizes this what this whole passage is about and it's maybe three sentences because usually pick the first passage <laughs> pick the first sentence because and sometimes that's right but it's not really answering the question so that I'm aware of with um, our kids are have the ability to comprehend we know that when we work one on one but when they're independent making sure that they're really showing that skill um the other thing I would say is our proficiency level is higher than the national average. Our proficiency level is 60% or higher. We have 18 <coughs> out of 104 students who are scoring in the 50th to 59th percentile. So we have this large group of kiddos that is, um, I'm looking on page four, that are, are very close to being in what's considered proficient meeting the standards for us. Okay. And those are, that's our target group, I would say. Um, trying to think what else about English language arts. One thing we are going to work on in some of our summer work is tightening some of our instruction so that our independent work, right, like teachers working with a group of kids, what are kids working on, <coughs> are focused in on vocabulary, grammar. We're going to start to take this to the next level, use some tools such as expressive writing to really focus on our writing ability. Um, yeah, so that, that's English language arts. Um, in, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. In uh, mathematics, if we kind of flip back to page two, so you will see that our spring score, we're about 40% uh, proficient right now as a whole. Um, so not where we want to be, but definitely my understanding is on track with what we're seeing SU wide too. Like for ELA. For ELA, yes. And then in mathematics, again, you'll see our, um, if you look on page two, to be, we're trying to have the math average scale score and meet proficient. Um, proficiency and same same code right <coughs> purple, purple dot is our scale score average scale score and the green triangle is what's proficient look at the kindergartners and really all the way up to grade That's three and even four yeah our fifth and sixth are pretty close they're close yeah which is impressive um it makes sense because we spent more time on our math like that was our first investment when those SR funds for COVID um, so we're seeing that um, we've had some kids who have never been proficient before who have met the standard for the first time this summer. So those are great celebrations. Um, and in K-1 mathematics, all our students are scoring in the 57th percentile or higher. So we're right there. Um, and there are 15 students out of 104 that are in that 50th to 59th percentile. So we've got a good chunk of kids that are really, really close that we need to kind of push over the edge. And you'll see overall that 62% of our population <laughs> is um, making, is meeting or exceeding the expectation. 
And then the last part, goal three, we are seeing a decrease in the percentage of students that are scoring in level one or well below expectations. If you look at the bottom of page two in the fall of 2022, that was 36% English language arts. In this last testing window, it's 26%. <clears throat> and in mathematics, it was 16% in 2022 and 13% in the spring of 2024. And I would say our biggest um, focal point in mathematics is really around fractional reasoning and building automaticity in math Maddox facts, because like if you can't, we probably all learned our math facts through like those timed one minute. <laughs> now you know your threes tables, now you know your fours tables. And there's something to be said about it not needing to be timed, but being able to come up with it because that helps you build what your factors and mm -hmm. your multiples are, which is definitely a struggle for some of our older students. Um, and understand the concept that it's like four groups of three, not just three plus three plus three plus three. So we're trying to right. switch our reasoning. Um, on June 17th, that will be a major part of our uh, professional development because we did receive some grant funding bridges. Our mathematics program went from version two to version three. We just got all the version three, like the, what's it called, like the transmission kit. So what you need that's different and staff will all be trained that afternoon <coughs> on what's in it, what are the differences, how to plan and prepare for that. Um, yeah, questions about academic, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm under the impression that we led the charge uh, with Bridges and now SU is going to be, that's going to be the math curriculum for all SU elementary schools, is that? Well, it was us, Chelsea and Tunbridge or First Branch and Newton. All three of us have been okay. using Bridges for now. Has it really been for years? For three years. And then, um, yes, the two other districts that were, so Sharon and White River Valley um, Unified District will be using the Bridges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because um, terrific. And it's by my math, the I measured by track my progress where we started which is the fall of 2022 would track my progress to this spring mm -hmm. we reduced the, the level one right uh, participation rate by approximately a third and our goal was 50 percent so I mean it's just huge <coughs> gains yep. there and we're well on our way um, that's um, I think that's uh, terrific. And when you think about 62% now, our goal is 50% proficiency in math, and we're already at 62% with a year to go. Uh, so when we keep charging ahead, I mean, that's um, phenomenally good, and that's both worth celebrating. My final is a question when will the youth understand the, the uh, Vermont CAP, the CAP uh, results will be uh, released? Uh, if what they say is true, last year was a, a, a right. difficulty. But... Usually August. Well, August would be great. Well, August to families. Usually it first goes out to families. There's a window of a memoriam where you can't share with anybody but individually, and then we would be able to share out with you. Yeah. But it got pushed back at least three times last year. Yeah. Does that sound right? That was frustrating. I went back and I looked at the state results for um for the uh, decap yeah um the state average uh, for the grades one two three four five six in um english language arts and and also in math and then grade five for science and our side is equal to or higher than the state average very close in math um uh, excuse me, very close to in English language arts, um, a little much higher, uh, more higher in math and science, we're off the charts for That's grade great. five. So, I mean, we're, we're competing with other S, SUs or other elementary schools, but also it's nice to know how the state's doing and how we're competing with the state. And we've got, being a, a, a needy rural town, I mean, we're doing I might take on this one snapshot, but well, we'll, have to, we'll see again. 
uh, how we're doing. I don't know if you have anything you want to say about that. I just, with that particular data set, what that showed us is if you were a kiddo who started with us in kindergarten and stayed with us all the way through, yeah, um, then it's like 76% of those kids were proficient. So they're either meeting or exceeding this yeah, actually, in all three areas. That's huge. Yeah. Um, they didn't kiddos who moved, yeah, kiddos who moved in and out. That's, that's sometimes a different story. But those who were with us from beginning to end. And those kiddos would have been virtual learning for uh, the sixth graders in third grade last year. I think I'm doing that right. So for a majority of their third grade year. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, does anybody have any questions for festival on the um, spring academic report? Okay. Then. So then we have social emotional yeah. learning. <laughs> and those windows get moved around. I think said a lot. Um, so. As I mentioned before, we use what's called PBIS, or Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports, um, which is our universal instruction. It's where we build expectations and routines around being respectful, responsible, and ready to learn and what that looks like in all environments. We also have focused on responsive classroom, which establishes class climate, <coughs> routine with morning meeting, um, building in expectations and routines about how to work independently um, and really just scaffolds that for teachers. It's something that we've invested a lot of time in. Um, we've also spent some time building our uh, targeted supports, so kiddos who maybe need a little bit more. So if you think about social, emotional, and academic, but social, emotional, we typically talk about in a triangle where our universal strategies uh, so recognition for meeting those expectations supports about 80% of our students. And then as you move up the triangle, about 15% of our students should require some targeted support and then about 5% re require more intensive um, supports. A targeted support could look something like a check-in, check-out sheet, could look and they're earning uh, maybe some time, additional time with adults, some one on one time, sometimes that's what kids need, but it's usually very data driven based on some observations um, and it's goal driven as well. So a kid's, kid is trying to specifically show that they're respectful, responsible and ready to learn by hands are to ourselves and not on our friends or mm -hmm. some of those areas. Um, so if we start to move down, to some specific uh, WRVS social emotional goals. Um, one of the first ones is that by 2027, uh, we will have a 25% decrease in intensive social emotional supports. And that's measured in two ways, uh, out of district placements, which currently we have none. So we're there uh, and we'll just stay there. And then percentage of students who are supported by one-on-one -on -one behavioral supports and currently uh, pre-K through six, that's only 2% of our population. Yes. Um, 2%, what does that mean? I can't even tell you because it becomes identifiable. Oh, okay. What it does mean is that usually we, we've gone through the targeted supports and something like a check-in, check-out, or more specific breaks in day. It be a lot of things. requires usually a one-on-one -on -one, uh, behavioral interventionist who helps be proactive to help teach pro-social skills instead of negative social skills that typically are, could be from uh, a trauma response, could be an attention seeking, could be a wide variety of things. So just depends, <coughs> depends on the situation. So, um, and then, so sorry, unfortunately, I can't, <laughs> so small that I can't tell you <laughs> who or how many? Um, well, which is interesting because I think if, if you can get them, like say being like negative thinking or right. whatever, yeah, yeah. it's going to inhibit them from doing well with everything else. And that last point? It, it won't, like, if, if they can't, if they can't <clears throat> respond positively 
socially and emotionally. They can't do that. Then they can't do the math. They can't do right. the right. Yeah. Right. And so that, this is huge. And that other yeah. goal is just like in academics is early intervention. Mm -hmm. So the earlier that we can put these supports in for kiddos yeah. and the younger they are, the sooner. And and this is like historical data nationwide that you could phase those supports out over time. You would mm -hmm. never just pull them away from a kiddo, but you could start to pull them back and build some independence mm -hmm. or like uh, those universal systems back in for those kiddos. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Next, you're going to see our office referrals, um, which are our behaviors that I directly deal with and um, provide consequences for what you will the goal for WRBSU is that there'll be a 20 percent decrease in the number of office referrals managed by administration we call them majors in our system that's how it holds it because they're the minor which is a teacher dealt thing and a major which is a me and teacher and parent dealt thing usually um, and what you will see in that is that we've Last school year, we had 143 major referrals. We have seen a 7% decrease in the number of referrals this school year, um, which puts it at like 134. <laughs> um, the largest concern universally is really around defiance, which is great. Uh, previous times has been hands-on, so it's great that we're graduating up with defiance. Uh, and refusal over hands on mm. any day. Um, so, and what do you think the problem was with December and March? <laughs> uh, so, December, <laughs> yes, I can actually tell you December would be the time with the most interruptions, usually between snow days and then vacation. Anytime we get no. into a vacation, there's a little bit of an uptick. Yeah. Friends who don't have plans. For students, sorry, they're all my friends, but students who don't have plans tend to like not know and it comes out in not a positive way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the same that like those who we can, can take the most, we give the most to mm -hmm. behaviorally, that's what we tend to see. And then what, March is just. March is the longest. Yeah. Right, yeah. we'll, we'll squirrely, is yeah. I would use. Yeah, like, I mean, it's the end of winter. We're kind of we'll outside out. more, we're kind of not. Yeah. Um, that definitely was one. And then in terms of day of the week, a majority of this, our staff has tied to days where there's more movement in their um, special. So if there's outdoor ed and PE, uh, we see less referrals on those days. It's so really each building only has one day a week where they don't have either of those. And we're seeing, so we're definitely talking about some sort of how to use our movement breaks in a more meaningful way than just letting kids run around. That's what you said. Um, Controlled movement. It kind of it kind of balances between the two places because it's not the same day in each of but, but that is the trend. How much of outdoor time do they get? In the day on uh, it's like forty anywhere from forty five minutes to an hour without outdoor ed or PE class. Without it. Okay. Yeah. They grade. say three hours a day for kids. Right. Yeah. So that's where it's like, how, how much should the school be responsible for? How much right. should parents be responsible for? Right. Those who participate in after school programs get yeah. more than that because yeah. they're outside for totally. probably a good hour yeah. after school as well. Yeah. Um, and then when we have outdoor ed or PE or winter wellness days mm -hmm. or field day or any of those yeah. activities. Um, yeah. Um, kind of moving on to some other things. This is probably the biggest concern is for us. By 2027, all WRBS schools will have a 33.3 decrease in chronic absenteeism. Chronic absenteeism is defined as absent 10% or more school days for any reason, whether it's excused or unexcused. For us, that is 23 students out of 104 who have missed 17 days or more of school, or 22% of the school population. And what I'll also share with that is kiddos that have missed 10 to 16 days is an additional 30 students 
Mm. Yep. Um, so we're at over 51% of our population who's missed 10%. Uh, or sorry, has missed 10 days or more of school. Um, it has become a focal point in our leadership team meetings and will be for our continuous improvement plan, how to wrap around supports. For those, because um, it's definitely an area, some of it is right for a long time. It was even if you had a sneeze, you had to stay home. Right. So we've had to kind of build back now, the knowledge that it's so okay. What do you think the reasoning is that? Some of, uh, not always. I will say we definitely had some school around schools that were like, I mean, I know just myself alone had yes. like the, the crud and that's the really official term that was diagnosed and it stayed around mm. for a long time. And the younger you are, the harder it is to like weather that storm and keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, some of it, we had a lot of people uh, take vacations not during school vacations yeah. which is your choice as a family but on the flip side of that what i'll share is those kiddos that missed this much uh who were considered chronically absent showed less than a year's worth of growth academically mm. like yeah so our current thought as a leadership team and as we work in our continuous improvement plan is to start the year off with some parent meetings for those folks to really sit down and show those and come up with a plan of support. Mm. Um, not trying to like scare anyone, but it just, it adds up. Cause well, that kind of goes hand in hand with like the personalized learning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so communicating with a parent. Right. Their child's history. Yeah. And reasoning. I think that's. And I would say majority of the absences are in upper elementary school. So it's a habit forming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're trying mm -hmm. to head all that off. Yeah. Well, it also points to the importance of one planet in the, in the summertime um, support targeting. Unfortunately, uh, those are not families that usually choose yeah. to take advantage of it. It's like a consistent thing. Sometimes it's about breaking down a barrier. If you think about your own experience at school, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to um, overcome your own experience as your child's going through. Mm -hmm. And so making ourselves more open, more accessible. Um, I think it's a big piece of that. Just how can we help? I think there's a lot going on for kiddos. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear that you are aware of it and uh, yeah. are going to. I'm also the threat. There are some families that have been like, if you don't go to school, Miss Betson comes to pick you up, which is totally fine. <laughs> the first time we've seen the last time, I'm sure. Right. If it works to get your kids to school, I bet I'm all for it. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what it takes. We can do that. It just seems also that the uh, the lasting impact of COVID just keeps going because I, I don't believe the absenteeism rates were this high pre-COVID. Um, by, by my knowledge, so I'm just curious whether it's just good, it takes us longer to Snap out of it, get, get back in sync. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what our rates were before. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah, and then kind of moving along, it's also to have a 25% decrease in harassment, hazing, and bullying substantiations. So as of this week, there have been 12 investigations. And only 16%, which is two, have been substantiated, which means after an investigation, um, it's true, right? right? That it was more than being unkind or mean, or mm -hmm. it's a little hard to decipher sometimes, but. Um, we'll go with that. Yeah, I think overall our kids are a very kind group of kids. I think we just need to work on um, we're a very competitive group of kids, which is, I'm all for it, but you can be kind and competitive at the same time. Yes, humble. Humble, yeah, that was a great word for it. Um, so then if you start to, oh, this printed for me, I apologize. Percentage of students who receive targeted supports, so that's that 15% typically. So 6% of our student population is on a formal check-in, check-out plan. We were at 4% in January. 
Um, I foresee that going down, you have some kiddos that are, and students who are supported by those plans are probably ready to be exited, but the team decided to wait until we transition because many of them will be having a new classroom and a new teacher, so it didn't feel like a smart idea to take right. away something that was known to them. Yeah, um, there's a lot of change about to happen. Right, and and just anytime you, anytime you transition to a different grade level, like there's different expectations, whether it's in the same classroom or a different classroom, different teacher. Um, so when something's working, we will start to phase those out for a handful um, at the beginning of the year, but we'll go the first six weeks of the school year keeping that plan in place and seeing how it goes. Uh, social emotional targeted intervention plan. So that's not necessarily a check in, check out, but it can be something like there's built in breaks to our day because we need to move a little bit more. We get squirrely. Like we've seen an increase in those. Again, um, some of that has come with some support of some OT referrals. So seeing that, like, this is a kiddo who's craving some sensory things, and if they don't get those sensory needs met, we see these behaviors. Mm -hmm. So building some sort of sensory diet is typically who, what this supports into their day, where they can go get that out. Um, not quite ready to always bring that into the classroom because it's usually a fidget, which then means we all have to have a fidget and we don't all need a fidget. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. Um, those who are supported by social emotional targeted intervention plans and academic intervention plans is actually 1% of our population, which is, it's decreasing. It's great to see. It means that like the social emotional piece, we, we do have figured out and it's not directly tied to academics anymore for some kiddos. Whereas when I would say when I first started, a lot of our social emotional needs were avoidance tactics around the content. Mm -hmm. sure. And then the number of students with academic and targeted plans uh, dropped from 28% to 26%. Did have several kids who were exited um, off of a targeted support plan academically this last go around, so that was great. Um, how does that? Um, how do kids handle that? Some of them don't want to not have it, especially in our upper elementary, because it's something they've always had. So they get a little nervous around nervous things. attached right to the adult yeah uh so we're really trying to work it's why we look at data like in these six week chunks or even smaller to ensure that like we're phasing in or phasing out yeah it's not, so, it's yeah, not a hard stop yeah um and they know that that person doesn't really go away um they're also getting better about advocating like, okay, if I'm not going to have this, what I still want to be able to do is test in a separate setting where I'm not going to get distracted or I can read everything out loud because that's how I process. Mm -hmm. um, so they've really figured out those accommodation pieces, which don't have to go away just because they're not receiving sure. the intervention services. Wow. Yeah. That's good. That's incredible for a yeah, kid to, to be that aware. To, yeah, be at that point to be aware. We're getting there. Yeah, well, that, we're getting there. That's great. We just don't that kind of goes with the social and emotional awareness, though, right? Right. I mean, aware of what you need. Correct. Right. And yeah. be willing and brave enough to say so. Yeah. Right. And which to me is a huge skill before they leave you. And you don't have to act out to get what you need, but you can say help. And what that can look like is, I need this. This isn't working for me. Here's well, the think, adults I can go to to get help. Well, so I think that opens another conversation, like with therapy. You know, right. Being like, mental health. There's always been a stigmatism around that. Mm -hmm. I think until recently, now it's looked at as a positive, um, a, a positive thing to do and, and have therapy. So I feel like, especially with the emotional. The, the social and emotional aspect, it's like we want our kids to feel like they can talk to somebody, mm -hmm. all of them, right. regardless exactly. if they have a problem or not. Um, do they have that opportunity? So one activity we've done in the past, and it actually just came up recently in our universal meeting, is we do a, we've done a connections activity where the kids pick three adults, and it could be more. 
the three adults they feel like they can go to. Yeah. It's anonymous, like usually our school counselor runs it and then puts it all together, right? Here's who this person thinks they can go to if they need anything. Yeah. And then the adults do it as well to see like who, oh. and then we overlap and it's like who, who doesn't have yeah. someone? Because it's yeah. true, like yeah. it happens. Yeah. It's not on intentional, but it happens. And especially if a kiddo is like, I can't come up with anyone, or it's only one person, because one person, all important, isn't always going to be here every single day. Yeah. So we look at that and then overlay and then do like a targeted, like this is half lunch groups or this is so they can start to build relationships. So we as adults kind of try and go after. So to speak, mm -hmm. to make sure every adult feels like they, or, every, student. <laughs> every student feels like they can come join an adult. Good. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of the things that just came up in our, uh, our uh, tiered fidelity survey that we did with staff is that we had done a lot of that and we need to bring it back to, just to make sure. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. Wonderful, really wonderful work. And then I would say the only other focal point is just, um, as always, training our new staff as they come in mm -hmm. so that we're not starting all over. So yeah. one of our um, our new kindergarten teachers already signed up for some responsive classrooms, so she'll get all the training that other folks didn't have Good. the past couple of years. So we're already starting those those things so we're not like in September and August and yeah. we've never done it before. Right, right. Yeah. Onboarding. Onboarding, right, which is a little more expensive than just here's the tour of where yeah. you work and yeah. right. people you can go to. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Questions? Excellent. That was a lot. <laughs> Any other questions for Lindy? That's really wonderful work. Okay, if I don't see any questions, let's move on to the policy committee. Um, so we might need to. Need Jamie to that one right now. <laughs> okay, so when Jamie gets back, so we're gonna um, save that for Jamie. Policy committee, we uh, table the policy uh, discussion until Jamie returns. Yes. Okay, so then let's move on to the celebration of learning. Yeah. So um, we've had several events in the past week and a half where we've all been together, nice. uh, which has been great. It started with so some great appreciations as I get ready. Uh, Mr. Perry or Mr. Jeffrey, as he's known to the kids, our music teacher, did his first Arsad music concert. Um, and so there was that, and every kid came over to rehearse then also a special uh thank you on that same day because why not uh we did the fire safety trailer with the rochester fire department we'll talk about that in a second and then if they weren't in rehearsal and they weren't at the fire safety trailer the great like teachers got together and planned different activities for all the kids to do together so there were reading buddies there was a bunch of stuff so i can kind of walk you through if we go to the next one the fire safety trailer was probably the most popular because they got to explore um, inside the trailer which is two different rooms uh what it's like when you stick something metal in the toaster and how that goes off um and how it gets warm first and then it bursts into flames also talking about how to exit and that that was the popular one. Oh, we can go back um and then I think my personal favorite is they had someone on the end of a of a landline, which most kids didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to practice dialing 911 to learn what they're and oh nice. And a member of the fire department was on the other line saying all the questions that oh, they would get really? asked. Yeah. Which That's really sweet. hit home to kids about their address. And if you didn't know your address, I'm still trying to what is around you that you could give as a description because like dispatch in vermont yeah. goes to central locations it's not local yeah. anymore so we have lots of conversations about like i live by the wild fern or you go past this post office and i'm up that road uh because there were a lot of kiddos that didn't know that and then my personal favorite 
what school is there emergency? Well, not really. I'm at school right now, and I'm just supposed to call you. What's the given line? Um, but probably also the most popular for kids is they got to try on the gear, they got to climb on the truck, they got to see all of the things. I had some students that probably would have stayed there all day if I let them, which was great. And then the fire department members also put all their gear on so kids knew what that looked like and wouldn't be scared. Wow. We saw somebody with an aspirator on, you know, yeah. and the heavy breathing. And all That's that incredible. Stuff. I don't know if I've ever seen that done before uh, to this extent. So it, I think it was it like great. there was an opening and we could get in and yeah. Caitlin Bowen, who also works here and is on the fire department, was like, do you want to do this? I said, yes, for both. Like yeah. I want everybody yeah. to do it. That's great. And I was a little worried about older kids because sometimes this isn't always geared, but they love it. Huh. So um, that was great. And then, right, yes. And we need volunteer firefighters. Though. We do. I had some that probably would have signed up right there. I was like, we might have to do a little exchange program here in the coming years. So in some great life learning, we had things like reading buddies, uh, which then Stockbridge and Rochester kiddos got to read together, which was great, instead of reading with your same classmates. Go ahead. But we also had number sentence bingo. So the caller, which was a kid, would say 20 minus six, and the kids had to find what that was. Oh, on their bingo card. On their bingo card, right. Oh, great. Um, we also had music concert and rehearsal, mm -hmm. and my favorite probably is the preschool watching the older kids. <laughs> on the yeah, right. right. Oh. <laughs> and then I will say that the band also got to perform, so all our kiddos who have been taking instrumental lessons with Barbie Those Scott good. and through summer music got to perform as well. Oh, so, that's great. Yes. Yeah, we so it was pleased. so the kids. So Scott Paulson taught music to me. Oh, really? Right. It's so funny to see him there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> and then we had field day last Thursday, and we had a gorgeous day. Mm -hmm. uh, we did head, shoulders, knees, and cone, <laughs> which is like if you head, shoulders, knees, and there's a cone in the middle, and then it eventually eliminates down to part, like eliminates pairs down to one on one. Sponge and water bucket relay, moving water from one bucket to another using a sponge ball toss where each hula hoop is worth a different point, you know, three teams, and what ball you choose to throw, whether it's a football, tennis ball, oh, a frisbee. Or something. Yes, it was uh, very, there's a That's map. fun. That's cool. Tug of war, which was popular until adults stepped in and then it wasn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> Obstacle courses, capture the flag, water balloon toss, park rangers, which is uh, kind of a version of like uh, fish and minnows, like somebody's in the middle. But the difference is the person in the middle is asking the kids on the other side, like, you have to pick an animal, and it's like, do you have scales? And only the kids with scales can run. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, but then the same concept if you get tagged, you help the person tagging. Um, drip, drop, drench, which nobody wanted to do because it was cold to start, but then by the end they were all soaked. And then the limbo. Um, and I would say the only request we had out of all of this uh, for next year was can we play K through six school wide like fish and minnows or a couple of games oh, instead of just being by grade look a full a full uh, on no, full capture yeah, the flag yeah, maybe or something that like fun. that. Cool. Yeah, so we were trying yeah. Water balloon top is fun, but you'll never have enough water balloons. Right. Right. For about 10, each station is about 10 minutes. And then they all have lunch together and recess and practicals. Wow, what a great day. Yeah, Thank sweet. you for organizing it. Your team I to can't organize say that. I did anything except hold some kids accountable that owed me minutes um, for not being kind or respectful. Oh, but if you go to some other ones, Miss Lindsay, our PE teacher, pretty much did everything, taught the kids all week. And then um, that's great. The week's coming up. And then um, all the teachers ran a station. So big, big thank you to all those folks. Yeah, I think there's one or two more. <laughs> that is great. What a day. Oh, yeah. Tug of War was popular. <laughs> that's the capture the flag and the ball toss. Yeah. I think that's and then everybody, that's each grade, got, yeah, right. Each grade got different t-shirts. Yeah. So we did tie-dye last year. 
this year felt a little tight. So we just, uh, and a couple years ago, we had just done straight colored shirts. So we did those. Um, but I think the plan for next year is our art teacher, Nicole, really wants to do tie dye as like the art class ahead of time. Yeah, that's so that they can, fun. Yeah. So that is our celebration of life. Oh, that's a great. lot together, which has been great. That's a great way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have any art that they have. Fun. I'm not sure who was more exhausted. Teachers or kiddos. Oh, Each afternoon when we kind of parted ways. But yeah. Absolutely. That is great. All right. Any other um, questions or comments for Lindy on celebration of learning? Excellent. Okay. Um, I was hoping we can maybe skip around um, yeah. here a little bit just so we can have Jamie to support some of these conversations. Um, and so uh, why don't we start with, um, I don't know, 8.3, the concept of the full board um, district retreat in August. Does that sound good to you guys? Or do you want to wait for Jamie for that as well? So it sounds like he's going to send out a survey about what Saturday is sure. in August work. So, so the that idea that it would be like a full board. Next, right. And then we would break off in the afternoon. I'm not, it, yeah. So it not lunch and then we'd, yeah. yeah. Um, a concern was definitely brought up during the SU meeting and concern that I had is having a facilitator because we had a wonderful facilitator right. last last retreat that we had um, and so that would be you know my concern is finding a facilitator facilitators for, for every board yeah. you know to have a quality facilitator right. okay yeah I love that idea and I like the idea if we could do it in the summertime uh, rather than you know late September or whatever the case is even though and then the challenge is how many people are going to be here on Saturdays in August? Well, so, uh, so, so, that's so, that's why the survey will yeah, the right. survey is going to um, then the idea of piggybacking so it's one Saturday and you do both is, I think, efficient. Well, I know that the full board has had a, a hard time with um, having getting attendance at the retreat. So maybe that idea is going to be if we get more boards like in one spot. Okay. Yeah. And um, you know, it could be a networking kind of uh, atmosphere as well. Uh, I, you know, I, I during the summer it's harder for for me, but um, you know, I can try to make stuff work. So, um, do you have any comments on um, board retreat in August? No, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's like herding cats. You know, right. Well put. Sounds like the survey is the first spot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, um, Cynthia or JC, do you have any comment on um, having a, um, a full SU board retreat and then uh, breaking off into our own retreat in the afternoon? Um, I just wonder if that's enough time for our own retreat. I feel like we filled up our. <laughs> it is true. You know, it doesn't seem like enough time to me but I, I'm fine being part of it but I just wonder if it, you know okay. I really have enjoyed our, our last few retreats even without the facilitator like when Ethan was kind of facilitating or we were facilitating each other but I you know we filled up quite a few hours of time and I enjoyed that so that's my only comment Okay. Well, I, I hear you, and I think that would, if we go forward with this, it would be important to not have a, a large agenda for it, um, you know, large, not to have a big to-do list, to have it be more of a conversation of, a, you know, loose, loose discussion. So, well I noted, thank you. Yeah, with a focus on our mission. Right. Right, of course, a focused discussion, yeah. Yeah. but not a checklist. Yeah. Of, like, let's get yeah. this done and get totally. this done. And yeah. you know. yeah. The other thing is that uh, Justine is uh, copying from your playbook, but you've suggested why only one wouldn't we do better if we could have two retreats. And so if this right. one is possibly shorter in August, if we could have something 
uh, midwinter or something like that to reconnect, reaffirm, uh, re-energize um, would be um, certainly would be something that would still be potentially possible. If we could do. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think such subjects as you know continuity and you know recruitment and things yes. probably would not be appropriate for this upcoming uh, retreat, whereas it would fit in it easily in, a, yes. in an additional. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Okay, well, um, everybody look at their inbox for that uh, email to be coming around to so be able to provide the feedback so that, that something can get scheduled in the yeah. issue. So. Okay. Um, the facilities update, uh, do we want to wait for Jamie for that? So to, or do you want to? No, we don't. We don't have to. Okay. We, we can do it. Um, okay. Would you want to put that up on the screen though? The Jamie's spreadsheet. Session? Yeah, the spreadsheet. Yeah. yeah. I got it. So we um, have been working with Jamie and working with um, Keith Thompson uh, to Keith worked really hard to produce this for us. Um, so this spreadsheet, it's it's helpful. So it breaks it down into categories, you know, so you have your building envelope, roof, windows. So building envelope says 56. That's referring to, so this is Stockbridge that we're on right now. Okay. So that's referring to the front portion of the building that was built in 1956. Oh, okay. And then the building envelope 89 is the multi-purpose room built in 89. Then it, the first column is the age. Okay. Essentially of right now, how old it is. Yeah. Then uh, the estimated age. That's S yeah, estimated age. Estimated total life. Yeah, total life. Sorry, estimated total life. And then RUL is what what we have left. Okay. So as you can see, there's definitely a number of things that are in the negative. Um, so if, if you want to just kind of scroll Everybody, down, and then we'll. Sorry, if no. it's in the negative, does that mean that it's out? It means it's past due. Got yeah, it. Okay. Just double check. So, well over. Yeah, thank you. So, so yeah. the, the estimated life that they gave the building, that part, whatever we're talking about, was was column B at the yeah. 50. They said this, the, your estimated life of this building envelope is 50 years. We. But it's actually 60. Here's how old it really is. But it's, it's actually 68 years, years, years so. now, and yeah. we're you yeah. know yeah. in the hole. So, yeah. um, okay. so what I want to do first before we get into details yeah. is talking with Keith, talking with Jamie. We feel if you look at the bottom dollar, where's that at the bottom? So. So yeah, you know, it has everything in here, grounds, miscellaneous. Um, and then down at the bottom, highlighted in green, is what we think to be, so so you can see the three columns here. Yep. Um, it's hard to delineate, but let's see where it says capital projects total, 45,000. That is Keith's recommendation, say, for this year. Okay. This coming year. Yep, and yep. then the next year, would, would be there, correct? And so it's this isn't saying that we need to focus on just those things or those at all, but that was more, um, he was looking at it more in a safety manner. So like, we think right now we should focus on doing the fire alarm systems in Stockbridge, um, updating the furnace, there's propane furnace that heats the multi-purpose room, which is, is well out of date. Um, and then we want to, uh, paint the facade on mm -hmm. the multi-purpose room, probably have somebody come pressure wash the entire building. Um, and then we're going to, we'd like to start getting quotes together for replacing windows and doors that need it. So that would be what we want to really start focusing on at Stockbridge. And then can I ask a question? Yes. Before we switch buildings. Yes. I might be able to do this. Yes. Is there any talk about flip out like when I think exterior doors, I have to be honest, exterior doors, especially on the original, the first envelope building, yeah. 
really need to be replacement? Like so we want so, so essentially what I what I want to do is I want to go through no no Jump. no so I want to go through these with you and yeah. then kind of looking at broad plan. Yeah. We could spend at least two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> sure. a year on both these schools for the next five to 10 years, mm -hmm. realistically, to get us where we need to be. So I think that's what we need to ask for each year is 200,000. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds like a lot, but mm -hmm. relative to what we need to do, it's not. Um, and then I think we need to start picking away at these. So Jamie, Keith and I were thinking, okay, so if I go to come to the board now, let's say, you know, let's agree that we want to invest $200,000 into both buildings now. Now we'll then say, knowing that we can then determine where does it make sense to allocate the money on this chart, which the green is, is essentially where we want to begin. Um, and then we can get some, some uh, quotes gathered between now and our August meeting review them and then approve them to be done. So so like I said for Stockbridge it's it's 100% get the get the multi-purpose room painted. Um, fire alarm system I think we should consider that. I think the furnace we should we should consider before next winter, I think. Um, exterior doors I think was a big one like you said. I like think. I'd rather Yeah. Yeah. And we can talk more. And we can do the phase that out. But like, for instance, say all of them need to be replaced, but we should definitely replace like the entry doors that are right. being heavily used. Say the the, the classroom the doors going outside. outside. If we decide, okay, let's wait on those or whatever, we wait on that. But um, so that's what we're how we're thinking about handling that there. I mean, another thing um, we're discussing is the parking lot. So if you look. Stockbridge again, Ray. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the grounds up above, where are we? right there? So parking lot, two hundred thousand dollars, and we're already past due. So what I want to explore is we have PTO raising money right now for new basketball hoops. Um, we in the past what five to ten years have. We've changed drop off from being in the front of the building to the side of the building. Yeah. yeah. So, something Keith and I kind of thought of was maybe it's maybe we redo the blacktop where the basketball hoops are going to go. Mm -hmm. So that way we get the hoops in, have that done, squared away. And then we we're discussing well, maybe it's do the basketball hoops where they used to be, then leave a green space, and then have like a center median. Just a strip essentially where cars can come down, pull around to drop their kids off. And so he, he was saying, like, we should just draw something up. He has a graphic designer that can look at that, look at it, and then we can all look at it together and see if it would make sense. Um, but you know, definitely want to talk to you. Because currently, about it, but... yeah. currently they come in to the on the front, drop off the front there and yeah. back out. So you know, where you came in for where you came in for um the town for our budget meeting that's drop off and pick up. Oh, at the moment, sorry. yeah, that was one of those things we started with COVID. And right, so people so, are driving in and, and parking and no, turning around, like think of it. So, around. here's oh, this going. is it okay. right now. Yeah, so here's the playground space. Yeah, this is the little roadway that goes out behind the school, and then this is the multi purpose room building. Yeah. This is the walkway out to the parking lot. Yeah. And flagpoles here and here. Mm -hmm. So what I'm proposing is say basketball hoop court goes here. You redo that asphalt, put the hoops in, leave, pull this up, just leave a green space with like a pathway, and then have just a center median put in here. So when cars come up, they pull around and park here, or the delivery trucks can get out back. Mm hmm How many people um Park in the in the parking lot, Depends and does area. that affect that so that's, flow? That's why we yeah. yeah so that's why we need to look at it. Like how many yeah. staff members are there? Can we move the staff members okay. down? I don't know. You know, yeah. that, that those are all questions for you on whether it even work or not. 
but. right but that is part of as you're talking about like this resealing there's more than just we resealing. you don't have to do it in one shot right what else we can do it yeah and that's yeah yeah while we're doing it should we consider changing you know updating our flow of yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. um patrick we just with yeah. 200 thousand you're estimating we need per school or because this is just this is all just stock for yeah now parking yeah. is also ready to be done here it's at zero as opposed to negative three years um but we think it's worth waiting on getting quotes and exploring here until we know what happens with the high schools because we could probably partner on that um with the town if they take it uh so that's yeah right well this is great because we we've been saving money in our capital reserves and now we and the idea is okay what are the capital improvements that need to happen out there it's a roadmap it's not we're doing it all yeah, right now correct. It's, it's let's have an understanding of where what we're trying to do each year mm -hmm. yep and so i think like this so i'm, I'm calling this state you know phase one essentially so mm -hmm. i would like for your approval to say we need to just like what do we want to spend right now what are we willing to spend on both schools i mean we should spend it all but we can't do that but what are we willing to say budget then i can take that knowing that work with jamie and keith to determine uh a scope of work estimates mm -hmm. then come back in august get approval and move forward um and like we said not everything will need to be done so we're thinking like okay let's get um granite state or portland glass somebody to come in and look at both schools review all the windows and doors give us quotes on everything that needs to be replaced we don't need to replace them all right now but we can say these are the problem ones these are the ones that we want to do right now okay and, but, we have, but we have a sense of what the total cost will be um because right now these are all just just rough estimates they're magnitude of cost yeah yeah, yeah. Right. Patrick, what do we have in uh, as of july 1st in our capital reserve funds i don't recall i can't remember talking we, about that we, before but we, we added two hundred thousand, didn't we and then, so i want to say we had around 40. Yeah. we were thinking we're Tara will be able to speak to this directly yeah. but we're thinking we're right around three hundred thousand. yeah three left over yeah. plus the one time budget amount plus what we put away so that's why i mean i'm proposing 200 to to be split up between the two schools right now um start getting some estimates as to you know determine what the actual cost will be for some of these projects and then say in august we we decide what which parts we want to tackle yeah. Yeah, I really like uh, the format and uh, the, the detail and the timing. And, and as we get estimates in, we'll up, we're going to update this exactly what you need to do. And we need to. We we don't need a decision to. Do you need a? a no, I just I, I just want everybody's approval for me to say to act on the board's behalf right now to to work work it. You know. Getting better, us, get better estimates. Yeah, better estimates, a, a, a more um, in-depth scope of work and, mm -hmm. and uh, an accurate budget. And um, you're right, and you're asking us to consider a dollar amount and you will allocate what the dollar amount is rather than saying, hey, these are the projects. Yeah, I mean, because it's I, gonna cost this much. I would like us to at least have like a focus, essentially. Like, right. okay, we want, we definitely want to get a roofing company here to assess the roof here it's five we're looking at you know possibly five hundred thousand dollars but can how much longer can we get out of it can we phase that project mm -hmm. things like that so we might not touch the roof this year even though he has it under 24 25 well it's because that's the life expectancy correct and that's you know so but maybe it's having a better understanding of what that cost will be and if we can phase it then we can plan ahead in the next few years mm -hmm. to do it but i would say a huge one here is window this wing is nice the windows are all in good shape and doors mm -hmm. but if all the rest of the windows are all single pane i mean what, there's no point in going with pellet if you know it's all just <laughs> if it's all coming out. in and going out you going know? Out the um so I do think we need to look at that. We're talking about um, 
So yeah, replacing the the windows, you know, get somebody here, pressure wash, paint, um, and uh, looking at some of the brick getting repointed. There's some areas that need repointing. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, Go ahead. I just could say, I, um, whether you want an actual vote or a sense of the board, but I certainly supportive of uh, the, the target of 200,000 um, for this next year, um, distributed between the two schools. And you're going to come back with us with more information on yeah, exactly have to act on, each on the yeah. timing yeah. and, and yeah. the costs and all that sort of stuff. And I think it'd be nice if our next packet that we have this in it or mm -hmm. just so yeah. we can uh, come all over. But I, I really like the format and the timing and working with a, a budget amount. And it certainly encourages us, I think, to um, support what we did, which wasn't easy, which was to have $200,000 in our budget for, for capital. Um, and I think as we start to mold, sorry, I no. think as we start to mold this over, we can then determine accurately how how much should we be asking for each year, at yeah. least say right. in the next five to ten years, mm -hmm. and that to get our school where it needs to be, both schools, and then what do we ask for continuously after that to say get us to a point where we don't we don't need to um, ask the voters. For a, um, <coughs> uh, what do you call it, on? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I think that sounds great. Um, I would like to see, you know, I like looking at hard numbers to, mm -hmm. to give you, but I think that sounds good. Okay. You know, that, I think that, that sounds like a good way to go. Um, okay. So let's see. Yeah. yeah. Sure. You should get the sense from your other Yeah. I'll just go on there next. Is there any comments from JC or um, Cynthia about uh, what we're talking about and um, to kind of think about about $200,000 potentially from our reserve funds that we're going to use to start doing this um, improvement? No, I think it's great. And I think it's good to see that we're, we've been talking about this stuff for like for years now. And I think it's great to see it like coming into a actionable picture. Okay. Well awesome. Yes, I think a lot of things need to be done, but I'd like to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Great, well, there's there's no action we are taking, but we are just simply right. telling uh, Pat that, yeah, go, we, we like where, the direction you're going. Um, we definitely have more decisions that will will be actionable decisions as we go down. Yeah, the dollar amount was more to like if the board wasn't comfortable, right? If, they, if you were like, yeah, fifty thousand is all we want to use for research, right? We're right. not going to yeah. come in August. Yes. Your time, right? It, does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Perfect. I want a general sense of where how much you want to spend, which then will dictate. What we priorities. Both priorities. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. the board was like, no, we want to do 30. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Like, uh, right. Get the painter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, if there's no further questions, we, um, is Tara back on yet? Probably not. No. Okay, so, um, we. We, but I can do 8.5. Okay, did we did skip um, 8.1, 8.2, and just did okay. and 6.4. You want to go back to 6.4? Oh, let's do 6.4, yeah. And then we'll roll back down to so the you have policy B3, you've seen it before. All at this point, I think it's all of our boards have adopted this revision um, outside of Rochester, Stockbridge, Stratford, and First Branch. They meet tomorrow night, and then this revised policy would be enacted. Um, and this is uh, policy B3. Um, policy committee spent the last several months with revisions to this one um, for alcohol and drug free workplace. If you look, um, they have done a really good job of making certain we define alcohol as alcoholic beverages, uh, which it wasn't prior, um, and also uh, changed the definition of drug to make certain that it also incorporated, um, it could be prescription drugs used illegally and or as prescribed, but that is impacting someone's ability um, to serve, right? And so we would ask them to get checked out um, and, and see 
like a fitness for duty type note. Um, and so that was incorporated in this policy. Um, this is one of those ones where I think we have a, frankly, I think a, a sh much stronger policy than the VSBA model uh, huh. with this one. I, I'm going to share it with them. I just think the board's done some good work with this one. Yeah, the policy policy and, okay. and the boards. I have one question. Um, are, are the um, district boards, the SU board members included in this coverage of alcohol free, drug free? workplace because I didn't see us and I was just wondering I mean we're supposed to be setting the example <laughs> so uh, no I was just um I well it, it, yeah I, I mean it I doesn't explicitly say you know, board member but it certainly um yeah speaks to volunteer work study student employee I think right. that you could possibly argue we're employee we're volunteer yeah, yeah. what well, we're well, we get yeah 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 we're employees yeah. So we're yeah. Yeah. yes yeah Huh? Yes, that's where I think you would fall. Cheap, though. Boy. I, 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 I thought I was retired. Cheap, though. Welcome to education. Cheap help. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, look for a motion to adopt policy B3. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Second. Okay. <laughs> this motion's been made and seconded. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. uh, <clears throat> then this is the first reading of F10, the investment policy. Yes, F10 was just moved out of committee um, for, for investments. The Policy committee um, will be taking feedback on this. If folks aren't ready to provide feedback tonight, just know you can always email Patrick and I. Um, typically after the first reading, there's revisions that are made in policy committee this upcoming month in June. This one wouldn't be ready for act the quickest I could see us taking action on this one's in August. Okay. All right, well, if everybody read over that and um... And we did work hard to carve out if people had donated funds and it provides specific instructions around donated funds. We've so seen carve out on yeah. that one as well. Yeah. My general question is the language um, is does this allow us to invest in equities or is it all fixed income? You fixed income are classically the most secure means of investment other than putting your money under a mattress um but you're talking about growth of the investment uh normally you do it through uh prudent investment uh in equities and there's a balance of how much fixed and how much equities and so when i read this um i didn't know what to think uh, i'd like to think that, that we have the flexibility of doing both. I'm not suggesting what percentage is fixed, what percentage is equities. But if this is 100% fixed, then um, the growth is, is, is virtually nil. And there, if there's no growth, then the opportunity of using growth to reinvest in our infrastructure, our children, is going to be really circumscribed. So, um, and so I know the board was really, I, I mean, I would say it's under the definition, right, of the preservation of principle. The committee, at least, was not comfortable with a policy that allowed the board or, you know, the business <laughs> office to invest in a way that it could result in a loss. A loss. That was a pretty immediate, like, Whoa. you shouldn't be using public funds uh, to invest in a percentage, though. Yeah, I, you know what I mean. At that point in time, the policy I don't was not. Log it down. I'll put it. I'll put it in the thing because yeah, yeah. normally you don't have. It's not like zero sum. It's like over a period of time, because the market could go at any time could go south. Yeah. yeah. And what? Yeah. We've blown a hole. We we're not. We're violating. No, we're talking about over a reasonable period of time. So, because the market does go like this, but the normal market goes. So, um, and it's tough because they're trying to do this in one page um, to how to, to craft this up. Yes, yeah, so it's any of whatever. And some, yeah, I, mean, I would just say that there were some board members that were really caught up on investing, period. And so they were really strong that they didn't want 
other funds to be invested in a manner that it could result in a loss. That was the language that they felt strongly about at that time. Excellent. All right. Um, should we go down through that? This is exactly why we need policy. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Clear guidance. There's clear guidance. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Eight point one. Rochester Select Board informational meeting on June tenth for the purchase of the Rochester High School. So this will be the second um, information meeting that they've held. Um, I believe that they're planning on doing it in the um, auditorium. This is next um, Monday. What yeah. time? 615. Mm -hmm. That's when the reservation is. <laughs> Okay. I don't ask certain what the title. Is. Uh, yeah. I, I just know when they reserved the auditorium for. Sorry. It was in the papers. Um, excellent. So uh, I was at the last informational meeting. Um, yeah, there was a lot of great conversations. Um, and there's definitely there's more to, to talk about. Um, you know, I think that they were the. The, the town was awarded um, three million dollars, two point two something point million four, dollars. Some additional yeah, matches. of of Senator Sanders' money, which is not available to the district board. So, um, should the town vote no, um, that money is not available for us to, as a board, to do a district to do anything in that um, space. Um, it is my opinion that if the town is interested in doing anything with that building, this really is their best shot. Mm -hmm. It is not something that our board, our district has the financial resources to do anything there. Um, that was an important point you made. Yeah. I don't think people really realize that. Uh, there's. You know, it's like it's like a major league baseball team in in a single A. I mean, we don't have the right. We the, don't. Uh, the, the skill set or the or the uh, wherewithal or the bullpen to, to make it happen. And the, and the other thing that was brought up was um well what would happen if the town votes it no and then we're going to have to have a lot of meetings to figure out what to do. I don't. Think we have a clear we don't have a clear path of what we would do because we it's so unknown we, we don't need have to plan B. Yeah. we don't we need to we need to figure out what's happening first um uh we have tried to put it up for sale in the past um so there are some avenues but i think that's the message is that i feel that the the best option for the town to do anything with this building is for the town to take ownership and to accept those funds to be able to do something and um, that if they decide not to, then it comes back to our board to have way more conversations about what direction we um, can go with it. But again, we don't have those financial resources to, to do any type of large renovations in there. So um, okay. I, just I have a question about that um, to kind of piggyback on what Amy was saying. Um, do we have a solid number? Lots of people um, I've been in conversation with or talk, you know, who are, are not interested in the building in Rochester talk about tearing it down. And I don't think I've ever heard other than rumors. Oh, what? We... Go ahead. So Jamie actually got a quote. A quote. Yep. And is it 1.7? Oh, I guess I missed that. That was for a tear down? 1.7 million for a tear down. Okay, and that includes the removal of the tanks? That's everything. Removal of everything, site seated right. over, nice lush lawn afterwards, all the abatement, all the, you know, all the permitting, things of that nature. And that was based off of, just so folks know, um, that EEI Investments provided us with that quote, and they utilized information from the Burlington City School teardown. So. Mm -hmm. It felt oh, okay. pretty solid on that number. Okay, great. And so if we were if it were to be torn down, then the bill for that would be on the district if the town did not buy it and the plan would be to tear it down. 
It, so if the town did not want to buy it, that's what I was saying. We would need to come back and decide as a district what would be our best option going forward. Um, and uh, we know it tear down is one of the options going forward. Put it up for sale is another option going forward. Putting a fence around it. But these are all options that we would really need to uh, deep dive into to make really smart decision of what we want to do going forward. Um, the other thing is, which I think is important, is that um, should the 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 town sh <coughs> uh, yeah, no, I lost my train of thought there, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, to answer your question, um, that could be a decision that this district makes going forward, um, but there are a lot of other decisions and conversations to have. Uh, the town of Rochester could decide to tear it down. If they take ownership, they could decide to tear it down instead as well. Right. And that decision would just be a board decision or would that be i'm not sure how that would work with the you know the articles or whatever if it was still a district building would it be a vote to tear it down or would it be just the board decides gosh i think we would need to look into that <coughs> you you go ahead robert well at this point they could the the, the select board could buy the building without any vote so, correct and so they could buy the building and then decide to tear it down without any vote. So, I meant if we were stuck, if we like ended up with it, we, with, we were stuck with this big decision, would it just be our decision as a board or, you know, that's- Either yeah. way. It could go either way. Yeah, I think I, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's such a large conversation that we're gonna have to have mm -hmm. um, that to, you know, and, and make some serious decisions um, should we get to that point. Yeah, I was just wondering if anybody knew. I don't personally know what if there's anything in the articles about disposal or sale or you know, does the town do the towns get to vote if it's a district decision on you know the sale of it or is it just the school board oh, that gets to decide? No, what, what what it is is that in the articles of agreement, um, any building that gets closed, the um, town has right of first refusal. They call it basically. Yep, no, the town that's not what I meant. Yep, no, I knew that. I meant yeah. if no, if they Rochester doesn't buy it, the district <clears throat> is in charge of the decision. Is it the school board's decision what what to do with it, or is will there be some sort of vote, uh, either t if we were to tear it down, right. or if we were to sell it, or if we were to give it to you know Pat Hudson, you know, would the town oh, vote yeah. on that, or would the school oh, board? <laughs> I do believe that we as a district would have the power to make such a decision. We could also so choose to take it to the our voters to okay. make a decision. Yep, that's the answer to my question. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't, sure. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure from the language in the articles if we could, or, or I don't think it's in there specifically that's that clear. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think you. there were also some derivative calculations of, okay, if we decide to tear it down, it would cost $1.7 million. And this is how much a bond would cost us per year. <coughs> Do you remember those figures? Right. They're substantial. Yeah. So anyway, um, there will be a informational meeting and, um, you know, I, I think, I think our board is if I speak for the board, would really encourage the town that this is their best option to do something positive with this building as to uh, acquire the building and use the Sanders money. Okay. I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, huge opportunity. And so much has been done successfully to have a real choice. Yeah. Why? Uh, why? Kudos to the committee and to you, sir, for your support. I mean, they've said it more than once that, uh, that your attention and uh, interest in this uh, has been um, very much appreciated. And, yeah, and I, I plan to attend on it. I don't think they're right. Um, I, yes. There will be questions of well, what will if we acquire it? What would? How much would the school be? And yeah, I'd love to. Uh, but that's very. I mean, we're very early at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
But we would have some interest to use the building parts of the I building. mean, I could currently only do it for performances. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to that. Yeah, but I think there, I mean, right. there there's be lots of talks about the future of the right. district, right? Yeah. And how we may or may not want to utilize that building. Okay. I know in the past, one of the rooms was a one planet room, and so that could potentially move one planet out of the. Yeah, family. we can talk about it when we get to that point. Yeah, absolutely. And there's every time you move kids out of a building into another, like that transition point is just so we have to work with just it's not true. Okay. They've got I know. I'm, team right one now. of the things I'm most excited about is this idea of partnering mm -hmm. further with child care. Child care, yeah. 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 Just to help support yeah. Yeah. bring more kids into our school. Yeah. Right. Well, and also um, to have a community and school auditorium for our arts mm -hmm. uh, programs, music, uh, theater. Um, I think it brings the community together and it brings the school with the community together. So it's a phenomenal resource. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you don't find an auditorium like that. Now, this one's run down a little bit, but I think the quality of the sound and the, the staging and then just the, um, from my, uh, it, it's special. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been packed too. You know, this farm's got talent filled the auditorium and then the music uh, performance really filled the auditorium. I was amazed at how many people attended and how full the seats were. And actually, you mentioned that it's run down, but a lot of it is brand new since Irene. So, you know, I agree about the auditorium being very special and a lot of work has been put into it recently. So. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's move on to 8.2 voters petition being circulated within the school district. Um, a Australian ballot question and a petition um, for the budget article. Um, and I believe they have been um, submitted to the town clerks or it's happening. Um, what the um, order of operations is, is that um, our district clerk, which is Pat, is going to need to certify that all the signatures that are on the petitions are uh, legal and valid and, and properly on there um, and other pieces of the, the um, petition. Um, so the uh, the you want to like explain the timeline? Sure. <laughs> so um, we understand we haven't seen them. But there's two petitions, right? And so the first part is our town clerks have provided us with their voter list, and we'll, Patrick will go through the process of ensuring that each signature um, is a legal resident and voter of each town, right? And so the overall percentage of the unified district is a minimum of 5%, which is about 78 votes. Uh, one certified um, and run through by legal, what the district board will need to do um, is warn a special meeting from the floor to take up each petition within 60 days. Um, when I spoke to Amy today, one of the things the board should know is that for the reconsideration of the budget article, that we have to take it up within 60 days, but there's not a minimum requirement for warning it. Okay. Because right. we've already won that article. So there is the opportunity to take action of that um, much earlier than 60 days, and even within the month of June if the board decided. What you need to do is take action on that article again, and then we would warn a special meeting from the floor to take up that reconsidered article. We will need to coordinate like that date and time, of course, with your <coughs> CAs and town clerks to ensure that the, that they're there to process that article and also our, our elected moderator. Okay. And a couple questions. What is the the five percent? Is, is there a minimum for each town, or is it it's going to be one to five? five sure. So it's seventy-eight. Second question is. Um, the um, the vote itself, the revote, or what do you want to call it? Uh, again, um, uh, under our current articles of agreement, would be done in person. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then the th third question is: My understanding is under state law that we can't change the warn. Uh, what do you call it? Article six, the amount. So it would be a, a, the initial vote would be the exact budget 
that was approved uh, 72 to 30, I believe, back in May 7th. So it's Correct. not like we're can adjust. Right, what's it a defeated law. article? Huh? Exactly. Because it's not a defeated right. article. It's <laughs> not for us. So it's a resubmission where people can rethink and re evaluate. It could be amended from the floor. Huh? It could oh, be absolutely. Amended. Absolutely. The amount could be amended from the floor. Yeah. Yeah. As it could in the initial. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so um, we probably will have some special meetings. Yeah, so one of the things under this article I wanted to do is if, you know, we'll get an email out to the board once Patrick certifies it and he'll notify the town clerks, um, is what availability might be for you guys to have a quick meeting, even possibly next Monday evening, to take action on warning a meeting. Um, next Monday is the Rochester. So. Well, yeah. We can do it before. I can do it before. But if they're at 6.15, if we have a quorum by 5.30, yeah. I mean, it's literally going to be just a move to set the date time yeah. Yeah. to address the article. Okay. And I could, between now and then, I can work to figure out what dates line up for our moderator and our clerks and our BCAs. I mean, I don't know how the board feels. I'm sort of in a place where I'm very concerned about taking up this article in July, just because I'm worried about folks being around. So, you know, my preference would be that we get a budget approved before July 1, just because that's helpful for the business office. Yeah. Um, you know, but if not July 1, I think we need to be careful about either, you know, then pushing it off to late July or early August. I don't think we want to mess around around the first couple of weeks in July when people will be traveling and not around. You know, also just going into the summer with uncertainty. Um, we were talking here earlier about um, a, a rough target amount for reinvesting in our buildings, 200,000. Okay, we don't know what, the, what that number is going to be uh, if we waited another two months. We have that uncertainty, and how do you plan and organize uh, going forward on that? So I think um, what you're advising makes sense. We will need, I think we should have separate meetings for this because I think we shouldn't confuse the questions. This is my other piece of advice, is that if we receive the petition for the Australian ballot measure, we should take care of getting the budget, rewarned, take up that question, and then I would suggest we have then another special meeting within the 60 days time frame to take up the Australian ballot petition question. I agree, separate it to not. I just think otherwise it could, that evening to get um, very focused on the Australian ballot question possibly and, and be questioning why are we taking up this, you know, the budget tonight. Like, I just think it's better than cleaner. Oh, yes, 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 And again, is that uh, you know, a standard ballot question? will have to happen from the floor. It has to be from the floor again yeah. because that's what our article yep. agreements say it is. Yep. Until uh, if this passes, then that and changes. And if this article, article passes, is then moving right forward. moving forward, right, we would take up that the Australian uh, that business. I haven't seen the petition to know how they worded it. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be helpful as soon as you see it to uh, make a copy of it uh, through we'll get it and and it's it's look at it. Um, and let's uh, we've got to make a priority on our calendars. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds and like absolutely for June. Okay, great. Let's move on to 8.5, the tax anticipation note. Let's tear it back. No? If not, if Ray, if you project the tax anticipation. The same thing? Yeah. There's the warning and stuff in it. <clears throat> so keep going down. Mm -hmm. So what the board would need to do is they would move to approve the signing of the non-arbitrage and use of proceeds certificate, arbitrage certificate, resolution, and note with Community National Bank for the FY25 tax anticipation note. So we may execute, where he's really testing me here, the appropriate documents and instruct the treasurer of each district to sign for Nine hundred eighty-six thousand three eighty, and you could move what I just said. So <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Absolutely. Okay, the motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? 
Great. Hearing no discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Okay. 8.6, appoint a treasurer. Um, so, uh, uh, Julie Gravi has been voted in as our new treasurer effective July 1. We would like to appoint her to finish out um, to start for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, really would. I'll so I'd like to move this year. Julie Gravi to be appointed as our treasurer um, effective when uh, she voted. Yeah. For the remainder. Or immediately, thank you. Through like June 30th, you know, 2024. Yes. Second. Okay, excellent. There's no a motion is consecutive. Uh, is there any discussion? Great. Hearing no discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Okay. Will somebody notify Julie uh, officially and welcome? Yep. Sarah's been communicating with her. Thank you. Eight point seven. Okay. Sorry. I Anybody lost my phone and left it at home? My kid wasn't supposed to pick up in the oh. work right now, so I just tell her to, it's okay, come walk down to the school or call dad. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so uh, chapter six, the last chapter in our book club book, um, talking about looking ahead. Um, and actually, right before we uh, started, uh, Robert had a comment that he uh summed it up with two words uh, continuity and collaboration i think those are the two themes of that chapter and and um, um yes and, and as far as continuity i've made alluded to it i've said in the past that i'd like for our for us to do on our retreats to look at continuity and then again reiterate that it's important for us because we, we know we're going to have turn up in the board. Yeah. And the second was? Collaboration. Collaboration, collaboration. yes. And we do some with the KTO, but I'm, I, you know, I'm unfamiliar with how much we do and where we can go with that. Yeah, the first couple, I mean, the first page, I was like, that's a great idea that they had the PTO lead the, the, the survey and to, to actually the parents and families were involved in this decision, and so they owned it. And I thought that was really great. Yeah, I like um, what I like about this book. It gets us thinking. It gets us to say, "Yeah, we're doing this," and giving us ideas that hey, we might try this out. Uh, it also re it encourages us to think with an open mind, appreciating each other, uh, and honor the fact that we've got collaboration and teamwork and talent um, on the board and uh, the people that serve through our educational administration and community. So, um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to, before our retreat, be researching a possible sequel for our book club for next year, whether it's a book or I don't know what it is, but um, I get a kick out of it and I certainly <coughs> I'm learning a lot. I do like the books. I do think it would, I mean, it'd be a lot more work though, but um, to pick some VSBA articles or some, you know, per, you know, stuff that's, um, you know, happening now, uh, I think that would be a neat idea as well. I also wanted to suggest I, I'm on a number of different boards um, and there's a lot there's it, uh, a lot of different board structures and um, part of this uh, in this chapter it mentions um, ad hoc task forces and I've been in uh, some other boards that have like what what they would call pods where they could include, you could include community members and parents just for specific tasks led by, you know, a group of school board members, but also including the community. I think that might be an interesting thing to explore and in, in collaboration and outreach into the community and involving, you know, we talked about in our retreats involving um, parents more and, um, I would like to see different ways we might be able to brainstorm 
that concept um, and different models and how we can do that. Great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, is there any other um, comments on the book? Uh, if not, we'll move on to new hires and resignations. Uh, we're still working our way through the hiring process for several positions. We hold some interviews, but nothing's finalized since our last meeting at this time. Okay. Kindergarten. That was the last meeting. That was the last meeting. Okay. Great. I guess well, we did just two weeks ago. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, we have our second uh, public comment. Uh, Oh, go ahead, 3-8. Uh, yeah, I have some questions. One is the petitions, the voter petitions. Are they still available? I was totally unaware of them. Um, I do not know. I just knew that they were being circled around our community. Um, you, I, would, I would call your town clerk, yeah. probably. Uh, I'm the clerk, and I'm scheduled to pick them up mid-morning tomorrow from both Rochester and Stockbridge. Okay, because I'm on the email list for Stockbridge, and they never sent anything out notifying us that there was uh, this type of petition being circulated. So I was just curious. <clears throat> um, it would not I, I guess be. A, my, it would not pardon? be. A, it's not a municipal uh, action. This is done by private individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. I, I want to say I had uh, Do Donna Bryant reach out to me today, um, and I. To me, it seems like she was leading it up, so you could always reach out to her. Okay. I'll, I can also stop down by the town tomorrow morning, first thing. Um, I guess my questions are, I want to make sure I understood Patrick correctly regarding the capital improvements which would be required uh, at the two buildings. Was that 200000 per building or 200000 for both buildings? Both buildings total. So it's two hundred, And you're saying you see us spending that for the, a period of approximately Five years or greater than five years? Uh, that's real rough numbers, but yeah, approximately five plus years. Um, I think it's going to depend on when we start to compile estimates, because uh, right now it's just general dollar amounts. So as we start to dig deeper and get factual numbers, I think it'll be a lot easier for us to update that, that spreadsheet to be um to give us more factual numbers each year what we what we That's truly need almost yeah okay almost like a brain, it's almost a brainstorm at this point just to uh get us in a direction moving forward okay and i guess my next two comments are not going to be very popular ones um my first comment is i'm curious has the board ever done a study to see what the results would be if we decided to close one of the campuses and the campus that would be uh, that I would think you would close would be Stockbridge. Uh, the Rochester building, I think, offers more uh, facilities to the students. Um, and I think it would be uh, a better fit to have a larger student population than the Stockbridge building. Has that um, you, study like that asking, ever been done? Are you asking a financial? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the community could, yeah, so the community could see what the potential savings are, as well as what benefits the students may experience by combining both campuses. I do believe that when there was a petition to unmerge, um, a financial uh, projection was indeed created at that time. But that projection was, I thought, and Jamie, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I thought that project projection was to show how each district would be if it was a standalone district. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah, excuse me. That, I, I, yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Uh, sure. I to, can I make an, uh, provide a bit of an answer there? I, I don't think we have put that any energy into that because in our uh, sur community surveys, we didn't have a strong um, desire of the communities to go into one campus. We went but, over but our basically, community survey last but going, time. But, but you're asking people to make a blind decision. I mean, they, maybe if they saw what the numbers were and what the potential is, they would view it differently. Just to ask the question, do you want to close your, your school in Stockbridge or do you want to close your school in Rochester, 
The answer is no, of course I don't. But if I have more facts, hard facts, maybe I look at it differently. And I would like to see the board, you know, undertake this process and take a look at it because it's going to be important for the long-term viability of this district, in my opinion. The homeowners here can't afford to continue 8% increases. Um, and, you know, I'd like to see the board do something along those lines and not wait to the last minute where, you know, we basically have a gun to our head and these decisions have to be made because all of a sudden we realize we can't afford to continue along this path. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, I think that is something that, um, as a board, we can talk about if we want to explore um, looking at those numbers. But thank you very much for bringing that up. I would, um, I'm very interested to know, uh, you know, the, the majority of feedback we've received from our voters is that uh, cutting down one of the buildings is not something that they're at all interested in us exploring. But, okay, but um, again, I'm open to the conversation, absolutely. Again, that's just, a, you know, as I said, a blind decision with no facts. My second comment, has the board ever considered, I mean, we're looking at spending lots of money for capital improvements. Um, has the board ever taken a look at the tuition we pay to outside districts? I looked at it, and when I looked at the um, 76 students that we have in grades 7 through 12, we pay out above and beyond what it would cost us to send it to the WRSVU high school and middle school. We pay out over $135,000 to other districts so they have our money and they can make improvements uh, and use it to better their students. Wouldn't it make more sense to cap the tuition that we pay, take that $135,000 and you have 65% of what you need for your $200,000 improvements. I well, mean, it's really unfair. Um, yeah, and thank you for that. Um, currently, um, on, in our Articles of Agreement, our high schoolers have choice. Um, that, again, is something that we as a district could take up and look at uh, different options. But I do know that that was, um, but, uh, right. that was a, a, a key point in um, our Articles of, of Agreement was to keep the um, uh, school choice. Um, but, but Amy, I'm not saying you, you don't have school choice. I'm but, saying let the, let, the, let the parents of the people who want to send their children to another district pay the difference. I mean, one of the districts that you have listed that not many students go to, which is a good thing, costs $5,000 more per student to send them to yeah. that district. Uh, Randolph just recently increased their um, tuition. I, I don't think it's a bad but idea to look at that. I think we, I think we can look at it and see what because because it is our flagship um, school. You know, we are trying to invest as much. I mean, as Jim, as I, I see. I, I see yes. I see the value in looking at that. Um, I do think that school choices is, is very important, being where we're located. Um, mainly because we have parents that work all over central Vermont. Um, so for some parents, it's, it's not as viable to send their kids towards South Royalton as say it would be to send them to Middlebury or Rutland. And I understand that. We're not taking, but you're not taking away the choice. You're just saying, okay, you have to pay the difference. That's all. Well, they still have the choice. That's an interesting concept, and I would uh, we can take it under we can look into the legality of it to start with, um, and um, you know what what that would look Jamie? like. Jamie, Jamie, does any other district have a policy like that in place? Um, I've I've asked one of my board members to respond, and then you, um, Jamie can answer your question. Uh, I would say that for a lot of parents who want to go to a higher cost school that. To make them pay the difference essentially eliminates that as an option for them and that's not i don't think is equitable okay but i think it's more critical for us to take care of our students in the district and improve our buildings and take that money so it benefits us not out districts outside of us i really think it's unfair 
Well, thank you. And besides Randolph, all the rest of them are within a thousand dollars. So we're not talking huge. Um, uh, let me see. I didn't think that was the case. Let's yeah. see. Um, Sharon is three thousand dollars more. Um, and Randolph was the one that was five thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. Middlebury is twenty five hundred. Middlebury's twenty five hundred. Where? Sharon is only one thousand dollars more in tuition to White River Valley. Mm -hmm. So um, that that chart is in your book. Double check that chart. Thank you very much for these comments. This is definitely um, something that we can talk about some more on. The okay, Amy. I understand. I will uh, stop, but I'm not going to go away. I really want the board to take this up seriously and not just say, oh, we're going to talk about it. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much. Okay. So is there other, any other um, public comment? Is there any other public on? No other public? Okay. Well, then our next regular scheduled meeting is going to be Monday, August 5th um, at the Stockbridge campus. And we will be um, potentially having, having some, special. some specials. Um, so with that, no, that is August. We take July off because for our administration and our business office, for them to be able to actually have some time off. So, okay. Well, if is there any future agenda items that we would like to address now uh, or add? I mean, now to, and if not, uh, just let me and Jamie know and we'll, Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.